continue looking at biodiversity. And this, we're going to be looking at fungi, plants, and animal and animals. Again, remember, fungi, plants, and animals all are made up of eukaryotic cells. As you can imagine, when we look at fungi, they are quite diverse. Uh, we often think of fungi as the typical mushroom, uh, but if we look carefully, uh, fungi exist in different forms, uh, from puffballs to uh, the mold that grows on an orange. Again, we're looking at a, at the diversity of fungi here. We're looking at sac fungi, we're looking at molds, we're looking at yeast and so on. They do have some significant common features even though they look quite diverse in, in structure. So let's look at some key characteristics of fungi. The most important characteristic of all fungi is that they are saprophytic which means that these organisms produce enzymes that basically decompose dead material. Secondly, as we said before, all fungi are, are composed of eukaryotic cells. Mostly, they are multicellular. They don't truly have organs as we see in higher organisms. Uh, they're very, very diverse in structure, and some are parasitic. Now, here we're looking at a parasite. Now, this is an interesting parasite that this particular insect is infected with fungi. The fungi produces a toxin that makes this insect fly high, way up into the canopy of trees, and then what it does is it releases all of the spores into the forest so that it can infect other insects and so on. So here we have a situation where the parasite is convincing the insect to do a job for it, and once the job is done, this poor insect dies. When we look at the structure of a fungi, we see that the fungi is really mostly a network of hyphae. The hyphae are embedded within uh, whatever structure it's, it's growing on. The hyphae form a stalk, and the stalk forms this canopy, and the canopy basically, as we refer to it as a fruiting body, produces spores. Now, often we look at the material below the surface as mycelia, which is nothing more than a meshwork of hyphae. We can look at this bread mold, and if you look carefully, you will see that the bread mold is composed of small fibers referred to as hyphae. The hyphae will actually form little fruiting bodies, uh, which are spores. The spores can now leave and become part of dust particles, which of course will infect other material and so on. Now we look at a different type of fungi. This fungi is actually referred to as a lichen. And a lichen is basically a combination of fungi and algae working together in harmony. We see lichens on rocks. We see lichens on, on, on tree bark. Uh, they require very little moisture. And uh, let's, look at, let's look at the next slide as to how they work. Here we're looking at a, a lichen. Uh, we can see that the lichen is made up of fungi, hyphae, and algae cells. The algae, as you can see, are green, and the algae provide the photosynthesis, which of course makes sugar, and the fungi provide a meshwork for trapping moisture. So the two microbes live together and they support each other, forming what we see as a lichen. The characteristics of plants, first of all, is they are multicellular, actually forming complex organs. They are photosynthetic. All cells have cell walls. And as we said before, they have complex organ systems. Since plants are so important, let's look at how the four major plant groups evolved.
To start with, we see that all plants evolved from algae as the common ancestor. Now, algae, first of all, are multicellular, and they evolve into short little mosses. And the mosses we have today are the separate group. At the same time, while the mosses were evolving, we see that vascular tissue became, came to being. Vascular tissue is, very, is a very important innovation in that vascular tissue allows plants to become bigger. So as a result, ferns, and ferns are much bigger than mosses. So we're looking at this with respect to key evolutionary innovations. First of all, multicellularity. Secondly, vascularization. And thirdly, we see to the right that, we, we evo that seeds, evol seeds evolved. Now, seeds are important because now an organism can move away from the water and spread further out into the land. Now, the seeds evolved first into cone-bearing type trees and eventually, even more important, into flowering-based plants. Now, as we can see, we're looking at mosses. Mosses are seedless, avascular structures. The mosses are small. They have to be near a water environment because the water environment is necessary for their procreation and because the water environment is necessary for their procrea procreation. And here we see some additional uh, avascular uh, plants. Besides mosses, we see liverworts, we see uh, hornworts, and all of these have the commonality of being avascular. Again, because they are avascular, they cannot get past a certain size because they don't have the vessels that allows the fluid to flow, and as a result, they get bigger and bigger. And, and again, I want to emphasize they have to live in a water-based environment. Here we are looking at additional examples of vascular organisms in plants like ferns, horsetails, and club mosses. Compared to mosses, you see how much larger these uh, plants are. Now when we get to seed-producing plants, the first of these were conifers, or we refer to them as gymnosperms. These are seed-producing cone-producing plants, and these were the first to pretty much move away from the water. They do not require water for procreation, and this was the dominant plant for millions and millions of years. Now when we get to seed-producing plants, the first of these were conifers, or we refer to them as gymnosperms. These are seed-producing, cone-producing plants. And these were the first to pretty much move away from the water. They do not require water for procreation. And this was the dominant plant for millions and millions of years. And finally, we'll look at the last group of flowering plants. Now, flowering plants have many advantages over cone-bearing plants. These are seed-producing. The flowers produce fruit. Now, the fruit's important because the fruit allows animals to participate in the reproductive process. Uh, animals will take the fruit and spread it out in far, far areas where the wind itself may not do the same. So, eventually, the dominant plants that exist on the planet today are angiosperms, or flowering-based plants. When it comes to the reproductive process, we understand, of course, that humans would go through a process of sexual reproduction. And plants will also go through a process of sexual reproduction, but plants essentially go through two levels of existence, gametophytes and gametophytes and sporophytes. Sometimes we don't realize this because we don't understand exactly how the process works. But if we're looking at the fern, for example, the fern will, it will exist in a small 
gametophyte state, which looks quite different from the sporophyte state that we normally associate ferns with. The point I want to make to you is that plants have alternate generations. Uh, and it gets quite complex, so we will not pursue this any further except to emphasize that while plants reproduce sexually, they have a, an, ex- an extremely complex reproductive cycle. When we look at cone-bearing plants, an interesting uh, point I want to make is that cone-bearing plants produce both male cones and female cones. Uh, pollen that is produced by the male cones, of course, fertilize female cones, producing the uh, process, as you can see in this slide, forming a mature plant. Mm-hmm.